G'day, I'm Sean and welcome to the Car Expert Podcast. As promised, we're back on a Monday again, normal operation, except James isn't here this week. We've got Josh joining us. Josh, welcome to the podcast, mate. Thanks for having me. First time, looking forward to it. Are you nervous? You all good? I'm fine. Absolutely fine. All right, very good. <laughs> <laughs> I can see that paper shaking. Don't <laughs> well, um, look, I think it's only fair, Scott, if we start out, we do a little Q&A with uh, Josh, yeah. let everyone get to know him. Um, so, Josh, how long have you been at Car Expert for now? Uh, about a month now, yeah. So We're Throwing you right in the deep end here. No, I feel like part of the furniture, so yeah. <laughs> well, you have been in the background of the podcast <laughs> in the last few weeks, but now we've brought you up to the front. So, let's run through a couple of things. Uh, what was your first car? Uh, Mark 6 Volkswagen Golf. Uh, 90 TSI. Yeah, James and you must get along very well. 90 TSI. 90 TSI. It was, <laughs> it was not a passion purchase. <laughs> um, it was on dad's advice. He said, this will be great, cheap to run, reliable. And towards the end, it was anything but. But, um, <laughs> but we've got to start somewhere. Absolutely. What are you driving these days? Uh, Volvo C30. So same kind of era. Um, a little bit different, a little bit funky. You don't see too many of them on the roads. No. But it's the turbo five-cylinder which a variation was put in the Focus RS at the time. So, And follow-up question on that. Does it have a standard exhaust or an obnoxious exhaust? No, it has an obnoxious exhaust. <laughs> it, was, it was not put on by me. It was oh. put on by the previous owner. As You haven't taken it off, are. though. So. No, I haven't taken it off. <laughs> um, but yeah, I don't know how long that'll stay in my garage for. Just uh, keep waking up the neighbours. Uh, fair enough. <laughs> All right, okay. Dream car. What, is, what would you be buying? Um, sticking again to kind of 2000s Porsche Carrera GT. Oh, um, that came out when I was probably yeah seven or eight years old. Um, one of the best sounding cars of all time. That 5.7 liter V10 is incredible, and it's just one of those halo cars that you don't see them very often. No, I think um, a lot of them got crashed as part of the problem. With that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but yeah, special car. Yeah, very cool. I think I had one as a Matchbox car, or Hot Wheels, or whatever it was back in the day. They were they were super cool things. That was. Yeah, that was the like early hypercar, really cool thing. That the Enzo, and there was a third one, LFA, the Lexus LFA. There you go, similar sort of era. Yeah, very cool. Uh, all right, you used to work in the uh, motorsport side of journalism prior to coming here. So, tell us, are you into race cars at all? So when I started that job, I really didn't know much about motorsport at all. I kind of jumped in blind, and it was a steep learning curve. <laughs> um, my first supercars event was Bathurst um, oh, wow. a few years ago. So, <laughs> Straight in the deep end. Yeah, it was the deep end. Um, a lot of running around to the garages and then up the mountain. So quite a lot of leg work that weekend. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a crazy sport. Um, there's a lot of emotion and yeah, the fans love it. How are you finding it here on the, on the motor car side of things? Um, definitely a calmer environment, which is nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I've, I've loved cars since I was a kid as opposed to motorsport where that was a new thing to me. This is more my style um, and yeah, I'm loving it. Oh, awesome. Well, we're going to talk about some very exciting things today. You're here to talk about a uh, tyre test you went on recently. Um, not the most exciting thing, but we have never actually talked about tyres on the podcast can before. We, can we not tell people it's not the most exciting thing at the start of the podcast? <laughs> okay, well, it's, it's not a Porsche Carrera GT. But, it's um, absolutely thrilling and you should stick around. Yes, yes it's a well-rounded conversation. Mm. Uh, um, we're also going to be talking about some updates from the Kia Tasman Ute. Uh, some new spy shots have mm. come out. Uh, and we're going to be talking about tritium chargers, which... Um, yeah, for those that don't know, they're a locally made uh, uh, EV charging company, um, but they might not be around for very long, but we're going to get to that very shortly. We're going to dive straight into the Tasman Ute, the Kia Tasman Ute. Now, some new spy shots came out. Mm. Uh, it's told us a lot about the car that we sort of, we, we were hoping they would have, but I guess we've now confirmed. So what do we now know from the spy shots that we didn't know before? So we know it looks like a Ute. Uh, that's a good start. Um, I've seen a lot of renderings going around on the web and a lot of people have taken the punt and we kind of expect it to look like a, a sort of modern, high-end, chunky Kia four-wheel drive with a tray on the back. But these spy, sh these spy shots, excu mm, excuse go. me, uh, you'd think it was my first time, um, show that it's going to have rear disc brakes, which is not always standard in this segment. A the lot of the- New Triton has drums on the back. has so, drums on yeah. the back. Uh, it's going to have a leaf sprung rear in at least some variants, probably all variants. The cost of developing two different suspension systems is not necessarily practical. And the reason that brands do that is that leaf sprung cars generally are better at carrying a load. When Nissan did move to a coil sprung rear on the Navara, they went through about five iterations to get it right because you'd put close to a ton in the back and it would drive like a powerboat with the nose up, which is not very good. Uh, we know it's going to have a four-wheel drive system with full-time four-wheel drive. So, yeah, so for a four auto system similar to like Ranger has, right? Exactly. So at the moment, a lot of the dual cabs in Australia, with the exception of the Ranger and the Mitsubishi Triton, 
you can't actually drive them in four-wheel drive on paved surfaces. You can have them in rear drive, and then when you're on gravel, the way the four-wheel drive system sets up, it doesn't damage it if you use it on a loose surface. So um, there goes your script. There goes my script. I'm not sure fly here. Um, the benefit of having that 4A system is if you are one of those ute buyers, which we know there are hundreds of out there, thousands of out there that drive these cars on the road every day, you can have the security of all-wheel drive traction in your big, heavy car on all-terrain tyres and not actually damage the vehicle. Yeah. The last two things, and I'm waffling on here, but a step to the tub, which is something that yeah, Ranger has and makes it thing. much easier for short people like yourself yes. to load things not into the train. Not a problem for you, but yes. no. <laughs> uh, and an interior that looks pretty high-end. It's very, I suppose, Sorento GT line in the way that it's all laid out. Yeah, I noticed um, on the splashes, you can see on the driver's seat, or uh, I think it's the driver's seat, um, it's got the controls like you have in a Santa Fe to be able to move the seat from the rear so it makes a bit of extra room in the back. Um, yeah, T-Bar Auto, that's kind of cool. <laughs> it doesn't have the silly dials like they've got in a lot of the, the high-end Kia stuff. So it looks like they've gone kind of rugged with the interior, like lush but rugged, which I guess is kind of a, a bold choice and we'll see whether that pays off for them. I think based on what we know about this Ute, and a lot of this is sort of whispers and rumours from dealers and insider sources, it's going to be potentially a little bigger than a Ranger and slot between the sort of Ranger and F-150 almost. I don't know exactly dimensionally where it'll be, but it's not going to be Triton sized. So with that bigger body, bigger interior comes the expectation of more luxury. Maybe you're trying to pull some people who might want a, an F-150 for the luxury, but don't want to pay that much or don't want a car that big. Um, it's also Kia's first attempt. And we know that cars get bigger and higher tech and more luxurious with every generation. Kia doesn't have the luxury of selling this thing for eight years and then updating it based on feedback. It needs to work straight away. And that means that it's going to aim at the top end and try to, I suppose, based on showroom appeal, really blow the existing competitors out of the water. Well, I find, and I, it's really interesting with the Kia. Most Ute manufacturers, they have an alliance with another manufacturer. It sort of helps a lot of offset do, some yeah. of the costs, it helps them develop, all those sort of things. Kia are going this alone. Mm. Now, we're not 100% on the engines yet, but we think it's going to have the... 2.2 litre four cylinder that we find in the Sorento at the uh, moment? Potentially a version of it. Yep. That engine is mated with a dual clutch transmission. It's not something we see in many commercial ve vehicles except for a couple of Renault vans. So I wouldn't be surprised if it's a version of that with a torque converter automatic and maybe a bit more grunt. Mm, so we're, we're hoping, and now that we know it's got leaf springs and uh, disc brakes at the rear, hopefully three and a half tonne towing capacity with it. Uh, Kia has said that it would need to have that. It's yeah. not going to come in behind the eight ball. It needs to meet the segment leader straight away. Okay, well, we'll uh, hang on to see what comes of that. As we get more news about the Kia Tasman Ute, we will bring it to you guys. Um, next year, I think, is what we're talking about actually getting it, right? Yeah, so our expectation is revealed this year, uh, potentially shown off at the Australian Open, which is Kia's hero event, um, and then on the roads late this year, early next year. So we're not going to have to wait long. No, that's, uh, that's going to come around real quick. Mm -hmm. So Tritium, now they were... Oh, uh, were uh, a local company based in Brisbane producing charges for the, the likes of ChargeFox and EV and uh, BP Charge, I think they're uh, called BP them. Pulse. BP Pulse, that's yeah. a, I'm a little bit confused about what As opposed to Ampole Amp Charge. Yes, um, so they were producing charges up to uh, 350 kilowatts, except for BP, which are only 150 kilowatts, so we'll gloss over that. <laughs> um, but they were also making charges uh, for companies in Europe. Uh, they were expanding into America. They were setting up an operations base mm. in Tennessee. But now, all of a sudden, they've come out and they've said, well, we're insolvent, we've got no money, and uh, the future is looking bleak. But I mean, feel free, to tell us a little bit more about it, Scott. Yeah, so this has been coming for a little while, and I'm, I'm going to cheat here. We've got a really excellent story on carexpert.com.au. We'll put a link in the show notes. Yep. I'm pointing at Sean because he does that. We will, I will. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, in a filing on the 18th of April with the US SEC, it's called for an administrator to be appointed. Um, the company itself is insolvent or is likely to become insolvent is what's been found. And at that point, there is a, a process it needs to go through. This has been coming for a little while. Um, the Australian has reported that there's already receivers and managers set up to take care of this. And we reported a little while ago that it was below a certain marker on the NASDAQ. And if your share price is below, I believe it's a dollar per share for an extended period of time, you get delisted. We've also reported that um, there are real quality issues at Tritium. We had a number of ex-employees speak to us who expressed concerns about the way the company was run, about the fact that the focus on engineering and quality was sort of I suppose, given away a little bit in search of that US expansion, call it a, an accelerated Boeing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Slightly so, less consequences, but yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're not having electric cars fall out mm, of the sky. No. But this process has been coming for a little while. And Tritium, which was put up on a pedestal by everyone from us in the industry to the Prime Minister, um, 
is sort of gone from Australian success story to a, a cautionary tale for when you try to expand your business too quickly and don't focus on the core tenets of quality. Mm. Well, one of the, the things that I read, uh, well, one of the quotes I read from one of the former employees was that, up now. Yeah, yeah, was that um, the management just wanted to play the blame game rather than actually fixing quality issues. So, But I actually am curious to know from Josh, given we're doing the, the welcome aboard thing, yeah. What is your impression and what have you heard about the EV charging experience before you were working at Car Expert, where it's something we talk about a lot? Well, I think it's definitely something that you notice growing. Um, in terms of where I live, kind of inner suburbs of Melbourne, there are a lot of shopping centres now that have, you know, long rows of Tesla charges. <laughs> and yeah, it, it feels like it is really an expanding network. Um, but news like this, obviously feels like a bit of a setback in that space. Now they're losing this, this, this company that makes charges. Do you think it's going to impact Aussie Motors a little bit when it comes to buying an EV, the ability to charge it, those sort of things? Look, I don't have an answer for you. I'm sorry. Uh, I'd love to. Um, but ultimately, like Tritium isn't the one rolling out the network. It's just a supplier in the same way that some company builds petrol bowsers and then BP puts them on its forecourts. I think the real shame about this from an Australian perspective is the loss of Australian engineering know-how. And the fact that this was up until very recently seen as a massive success story for the Australian motoring and engineering industries to the point where the Prime Minister was putting them on a pedestal oh. and uh, <laughs> removed its focus on quality and engineering and tried to expand too quickly and has really fallen in a hole. So um, I suppose the, the real shame is, uh, is that they tried to move a lot of jobs offshore. They were going to focus on the US market, which is expanding rapidly. And because of that process, we've now lost at this stage a company that was really flying the flag for Australia on the world stage. Mm. So one of the things, and obviously they didn't maintain the charging networks, they just produced the charges, but we often find when we go to charge an electric car at a public charging station, one or some of them are out of action. And I guess, does this present somewhat of a, a concern going forward in terms of parts availability, in terms of supply, in terms of repairs and maintenance? Because we know when, this is an example, when Holden pulled out of Australia, part of the deal was they had to provide parts for 10 years and AC Delco took up that challenge. Mm -hmm. Where does that leave us with this sort of thing and where does that conf like, is there confidence now for people to be able to charge their cars? I don't think there was confidence previously. Okay. Um, the number of chargers we've been to, as you say, that don't have a working charger, that are missing a part, that are waiting on parts is really significant. And uh, the fact that Tritium was pumping these chargers out didn't necessarily guarantee they'd be able to support them longer term. So. Already those issues were there. Uh, obviously, with the company insolvent and going through the process of, uh, I suppose, dealing with what comes next, having had trouble with its... Let me try that again. Sorry. Right. Um, obviously, with the company dealing with its insolvency, uh, having its share price dip below a certain point on the NASDAQ consolidated shares and still being below that point, um, there's a lot of other stuff it needs to work out. I have no doubt one of the things when its assets are dealt with is going to be the spare parts catalog and what that looks like longer term. Maybe a company that's already building electric car chargers buys up part of the Tritium operation and can use that to produce spare parts. Maybe Tritium exists as something making spare parts for itself as a smaller part of a bigger company. I have no idea how that all works, but um, it's definitely got to be a consideration and it was already a problem. Mm. All right, so Josh, we're going to throw you under the bus a little bit here with a couple of questions. That's all right. <laughs> so... You're a fairly young guy and you, at some point in the near future, you will be looking at a new car. Is an EV something that would be in your field at the moment, something you'd be considering? Definitely. I think for inner city living, um, for sure. I hadn't driven an EV until I arrived here and the EVs that I have driven, I've been really impressed in terms of you know the quietness, um, the ease of actually driving them. Um, so I would definitely consider it in, in this kind of context. Yeah. So, okay. You consider it based on what an EV is, but when it comes to the charging, I mean, is this something that concerns you and you and your mates if you were talking about it? Is this something that you make you go, hmm, don't know about that, or would you just charge at home and it wouldn't be a problem? Yeah, well, I mean, you find that you never find a petrol pump being out of action, so you don't want to have to worry. People are already worried about things like, you know, range anxiety. You don't then want to be worried about if the charge is going to work. Um, so I think a reliable charging network is really important. Well, we'll uh, have to wait and see what comes of this. It's, I think it's going to be interesting going forward. I didn't want to spend too long on it because yeah. it's still very uh, early days of the news. But um, I guess a couple of headline features, they were already bailing out of Australia to go and produce the charges in Tennessee. I believe so. <laughs> of all places. Yep. Um, uh, so I guess they were already sort of turning their backs on Australia a little bit, which is a bit sad to see. But, yeah. I mean, high costs of uh, wages and 
parts and production, I, you know, that's led a lot of companies to do a similar thing. So. All right, guys. This week, I want to know, and Josh, uh, this is a, a new one for you. You've been doing lots of data-heavy stories about what's the best boot size SUV and what are some of the other ones you've done recently. Fuel economy. Fuel economy. And looking at all these different segments here on the VPAC support. Yep. So just keeping in line with that, I want to know what four-wheel drive SUV that's under 60 grand would you guys buy? Do you want to go first, Josh, or should I make Scott go oh, first? I'm happy to go first. Okay, yeah, go on. Um, disclaimer, I don't do a whole lot of four-wheel driving myself. Um, but Nothing yeah. to most people that buy them. Fair enough. Um, I would go with... The GWM Tank 300. Okay. Um, for the 60k budget, you can spec it all the way to the top, and you're getting a really nice interior, four-wheel drive capability. Um, I know that guys who've driven it and reviewed it in here, they kind of complain about some of the safety assistance stuff, but um, apart from that, I think it's a pretty good package for that price. Okay, uh, Scott, what about you? Um, I'd like to say that Josh is going to soon have some four-wheel drive training. Oh, we're, we're very excited. sending you off to South Australia with yeah. Izuzu to do a, a couple of days of hardcore off-roading. So maybe that's one for a couple of weeks yeah. to check in how <laughs> we'll that bring went. you back and see whether it's converted or not. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, for me, for less than sixty grand, I'd be buying as much Mitsubishi Pajero Sport as possible. I mean, it's hard to go past tried and tested, right? It's it's tried and tested. Uh, it's also it's more expensive than it used to be, and it's quite old now under the skin compared to a Ford Everest or an Isuzu MUX, but it's still a very solid off-roader as we found in our testing. And it also still has, like we were talking about before with the Tasman, a full-time four-wheel drive system that lets you drive on slippery but paved roads with the extra security of not just being in rear drive. So solid, reliable, tested. Could do with an interior update, to be honest. Could do with an engine update too. <laughs> that's, let's, that's let's talk about that too. another day. <laughs> if you're struggling to choose between which sub $60,000 four-wheel drive SUV you would buy, we've got a great tool on our website. Head to Google, type in Help Me Car Expert, and check out the car chooser. You can select whether you want it to be a petrol, a hybrid, whether you want it for SUV, or maybe you want a sports car, because it can even help whittle down that. It lists every single car available in Australia, and it can even connect you to a dealer and get you a really good deal on a new car. We've got a whole swathe of deals on the website at the moment. We're constantly updating those. So check out Help Me Car Expert on Google and let us know how it goes. Leave a comment if you do use the service. Okay, Josh, it is your time to shine, mate. This is what you're here for this week. You're going to talk to us about tyres, uh, but not just any tyres. You went on a recent tyre test with Continental. So tell us a little bit about it. Yeah, so I went up to Sydney to test the new Max Contact MC7. It's catching Which is their kind of sports tyre for the road. Um, so it sits below the Sport con Contact SC7. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so many letters and numbers. Um, yeah, and it's basically their road performance tyre coming to Australia soon, goes on sale from June 1, already available overseas. And basically I did some testing there on track at Ludnam Raceway, which is about an hour west of Sydney. And then we drove from the racetrack, kind of country roads, all the way back to the airport. Um, so what does it go head to head with? Because I don't know a heap about the different tyre brands, but I have heard of a Michelin Pilot Sport. Yes. And that is in my head the benchmark. So they're shooting for the stars. They are going to okay. try and match up against the Pilot Sport 5. Yep. Um, and yeah, I mean, it wasn't a full tyre test, I must say. We kind of were only given one comparison product and they're a little bit secretive about what that was. But you did some digging. What was it? It was a, it was a Bridgestone something. Oh, no, it's a bit, <laughs> it was a big Bridgestone tape something. The tire, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> But um, yeah, out on track, we, they're really proud of the, wet, with the performance of this tyre. So they kind of put us out there, hoses on the track, got us to do some braking and a bit of um, yeah, corner work as well, handling work. And yeah, the new tyre was, was really impressive in that setting. Um, yeah, like obviously hard to get a, a full gauge in comparison, but it was great. And then we went out onto the road and they didn't even need hoses out there because oh, it, was, it, it was biblical levels of rain in Sydney, as you'd probably expect. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it just absolutely came down for two hours and they took us out on the country roads where, you know, not, not so great. If you're familiar with country roads in Sydney, there are a lot of potholes, um, wasn't smooth. And yeah, the tyre performed well in terms of keeping noise out of the cabin and yeah, you weren't doing too much high-speed handling work. Yeah. But what were you driving, by the way? What was the car they had? So on the track, we had BMW 330i's, and then on the road, we had some of those and also a C43 MG Mercedes. Okay. Um, so probably the kind of car that they expect people to equip this tire to. Um, yeah, like your sporty, 
road car, but not really high performance stuff. So what did you learn about tires? What are things that you didn't know about tires that you now know that is never going to leave your brain? <laughs> <laughs> so at the launch itself, they had basically this room and it was full of what looked like science experiments. And it was their way of trying to tell us about tire technology. Um, so in terms of things like the contact patch, what all, you know, the rivets in the tire, what they all do, um, ways that they're trying to get rid of sound and get rid of water. Um, yeah, it was some pretty heavy, heavy stuff in terms of information. Yep, a lot of notes taken, I imagine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I am really curious to know, because this is not something we've really done before. No. Um, and I suppose for a bit of background for the people listening, this is something we want to build out at Car Expert. We obviously, as we say every week, can help people buy new cars, but there's a whole lot to car ownership that we haven't previously covered that we want to start covering. And Josh is doing that. You'll see Max in the background is now on deck helping do that as well. Um, the tyre testing thing, Continental put this event on. It's, it's not sponsored, but they put the event on because obviously they want people to experience the tyres. Other brands do similar. We're still learning about how to go about that as well, but it's something that we, we really want to get better at because after a couple of years of owning a car or if you're like our videographer, Igor, maybe after a couple of weeks of driving your car, <laughs> these tyres are going to need replacing. Um, and, and it's something we haven't really covered properly before. Mm. So uh, just a, a couple of things about Continental I find really fascinating. They're actually one of the biggest manufacturers of automotive parts in the world, mm. which is, you just think tires, but they make wipers, they make hoses, they make all sorts of, of uh, really integral stuff to your car. But I guess um, the interesting thing is, yeah, their focus is on performance tires, but uh, is there a big push with them currently, and maybe they discussed this, is there a big push with them at the moment in terms of like, Eco tires, electric car tires, is that something they're pushing hard at the moment? Yeah, so they are. So they made a big point of this when we were over there. Um, in terms of sustainability, firstly, um, they've got a tire recycling program um, that they're really invested in. And also they just released the, I'm going to hopefully get this right, e-contact tire, which is an EV specific tire. So, so what makes it EV specific? Because any tire can be fitted to an electric car theoretically. Well, that's the thing. So all their tires have what they call an EV tick. It's <laughs> their way of saying you can fit it to an EV. Um, it's like saying that Sean's shoes are pavement approved. <laughs> 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 but yeah, the claim is that this e-contact tire is better able to put up with the demands that electric motors put on a car. So. Right, so that high torque output yeah. and, and then also being quiet and efficient as well. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So this is something we've seen from a few other brands. I know Michelin does Primacy EV tyres specifically for electric cars. I think Kumo works with some of the Korean brands on EV specific tyres as well. But yeah, the way they put their load through the tyre is very different to a petrol car. And on some of the really expensive electric cars in the States, the big heavy Rivians and Hummers and that sort of thing, People are reporting that they're only getting 5,000 or 10,000 Ks out of a set of tires because the strains are so great on them. So uh, I know Continental is obviously who we spoke to about this, but all of the brands are doing it. And it's actually a really interesting space that going forward, I suppose you can make a really hard tire that's very low rolling resistance, but has no traction and rides like a caster, basically. You can make it very soft and comfortable, but that then wears really quickly. Finding a balance between the two is something that all of these brands are grappling with. And it's going to be interesting to drive, I mean, if we're talking Carrera GT, back in the day, it really struggled to put its power down because of the tyres. And people say now on modern tyres, it drives very differently. I'd be fascinated to drive an Ionic 5N now versus in five years' time on a performance EV tyre and see how it changes. Mm. I think, and a big thing that we, we get a lot of comments, and when we discussed EV ownership a couple of weeks ago, we got a lot of comments of people saying tyre wear is a big thing. So... Do content talk about that? Like with these EV tires, is there a focus on longevity with the tire as well? Yeah, I think they're just trying to find the balance. Like all manufacturers, um, it's still a relatively new area, um, but they didn't really position it as either a long, really long lasting tire or, you know, they were just trying to get their foot in the door, I guess, in this EV space. Okay. Well, leave a comment, let us know, do you want us to do a really in-depth dive into uh, the specifics of EV ownership? So tires, I know we want insurance, that's on the list of yeah. what we're going to do in the coming weeks. Do we want tires? Do we want uh, fluid servicing? All those sort of things. Leave a comment, let us know because we will put Scott to work and uh, <laughs> come up, maybe we'll put Josh to work and come up with a decent data set so we can present it to you guys. Uh, I just want to talk about this briefly. We're nearly at the end. I know it's a long podcast, but um, the Mitsubishi Triton, we've got a video coming out this week. Finally, we've had managed to get it in the office. We've uh, had our hands on it. We've done a review. Wednesday, it will be live on the YouTube channel, but we've all had a drive of the Triton, I believe, this week in one form or another. Um, I just want to get some some quick feedback from you guys now that we've actually had it. Um, what do you think of it? Just, just you know, Really top level stuff. What, what, what do you think of the new Triton? 
Uh, it definitely feels like a step forward. The old one was old, and I know that <laughs> sounds really obvious, but there is sort of a point in a car's life where you start to feel its age. These Utes live longer than most cars. That Triton was more than, I think, 10 years old. Oh, at least. Um, most cars live to be about eight years old. Commercial vehicles a bit longer. It really felt its age, and this one's much nicer inside. I think it rides better. The new engine is punchier. My God, though, those driver assist systems. Mm. Oh, it's yeah. got a driver monitoring system. That doesn't and work. <laughs> if you scratch your nose, it tells you to put your eyes on the road. Yeah. If you look at the touchscreen, which you have to do because everything's in a touchscreen, it tells you to put your eyes on the road. Jack was telling us he drove in this morning and with the light sort of low in the morning because it couldn't see his face, rather than going, I don't have the data to tell him, it just told him the whole way 27 times that he needed to look at the road. It oh. is ridiculous. Mm. And it's weird because it's positioned in a spot that should actually be good. It's mounts on top yeah. of the... The steering column. Uh, one of the things that surprised me, there's no traction control button. And when you, obviously when you're driving the road, leave the traction control button on. But when you go off-road, uh, if you switch it to low range, it automatically disengages. But if you're in high range and you, you want to be able to have some wheel slip, you have to dive through the dash menus to be able to turn it off, which is a really odd choice for a four-wheel mm. drive. Um, Josh, did you get to have a steer of it? Very briefly, yeah. I haven't driven the old car, um, but I share exactly the same complaint as Scott in terms of driver assistance <laughs> and Jack. It seems like everyone. Um, yeah, I feel like just driving the car, it wanted me to try harder at driving the car because <laughs> my eyes were on the road and it didn't think they were. So, yeah, yeah I mean, it's hard to get over something like that. It feels um, like they've taken that system straight from a Great Wall because the Great Wall cars have a very similar problem where if you look at the mirror or you look at the mirror or you look at the screen, it just beeps at you and there's nothing you could do to stop it. So I am curious to know, you've driven a couple of Ford Everest since joining us. Your first review is of an Everest that we've worked together on. Um, how did you find the difference between the ute and then the ute-based four-wheel drive and then the other cars you've driven? Um, I found the driving experience actually quite similar between okay. the two of them um, in terms of obviously you sit quite high, similar kind of engines um, and driving characteristics. Yep. Um, but yeah, obviously the rest of the cars I've driven and have been reviewing have been a lot smaller. So gotcha. yeah, it really depends on the setting how you experience them, I suppose. Yep. But yeah, in... When I've been in the city driving to work, it's been nice having the little Mazda 2. Um, but yeah, I went on a road trip a couple of weekends ago and the Everest was was great for that purpose, yeah. Oh, the Everest is a fantastic car, whether it's, and I think you have the two-wheel drive one as well, yeah. which is really quite lovely to drive, mm. unless you want to go off-road. But uh, yeah, you're not an off-roader, so we've already learned that. Um, look, we do have that video coming out live on the YouTube channel on Wednesday, so make sure you're subscribed and turn on the bell notification. You will be notified about that as soon as it goes live. All right, guys, picks of the week. Josh, you are our guest, so you get to go first. What is your pick this week? What caught your eye? I'm going to do a Scott and refer to my notes quickly. Go on, but, that's um, <laughs> <laughs> My pick of the week is the Hyundai Ioniq 5 NEN1 Cup. I thought so, the tires had a lot of <laughs> yeah, letters. <laughs> set myself a challenge. Um, it's basically a, an Ioniq 5N racer um, that's been developed. It's going to race in a one-make series in Korea to start oh. with. And... Yeah, it's basically, I guess, Hyundai de demonstrating the capabilities of, of this car. And, you know, people have already been quite impressed by it, the road going version. But the racer is basically just stripped out, roll cage, racing seats, a uh, whole lot of aero. And, yeah, they're going to throw them into a, into a one-make series. Priced at 160,000 euros, which is about 260,000 Australian. Seems affordable for a race which car. Which is, yeah, cheap, yeah, is quite a cheap race car. Um, so, yeah, that was my pick. And... A couple of interesting things about the series that they're actually going to race in is they've been inspired by video games, which is, oh you dear. know, make of that what you will. Oh dear. <laughs> um, but basically, they're going to have a feature where drivers can be pen penalized with a power cut from race control. Oh, it's just like electric um, go-karting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's going to be one part of it. And also the teams, because obviously the EV is silent. The teams get to choose what car, what sound their car makes. I, like that. <laughs> I really so like that. So that'll be fascinating to see. Uh, yeah, I don't know if there's any restriction to that. Yeah. Um, what they go with. Yeah. I just want to hear a whole lot of cars going ka chow, ka chow, yeah. ka chow. And then someone comes past like a seven eight seven B, screaming down there. One thing I'm curious, and you probably don't have the answer to this, but what happens when there's a crash? Mm. Is like because with EVs, I mean, internal combustion race cars just. Pull it back to the garage, you rip it apart, and you put it back together again. But with the EVs, that's going to be a little bit more of a challenge, I imagine. Yeah, I do not know how they're going to address that. But um, if they've thought of the sound for the cars, yeah. I'm sure they've thought of that <laughs> yeah, as well. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, Scott, what's your pick this week? Couldn't be further from uh, from Josh's. 
Um, one of my best mates got married recently um, and he is now over in Peru with his wife on their honeymoon and he keeps sending me photos of the cars of Peru and they are fantastic. They're all old Daewoo's and city cars, but they've all been dressed up like a seven-year-old does on Midnight Club. So they've got stickers across the top of the windscreen. Oh, oh. One of them says Need for Speed Most Wanted. <laughs> I was, was going like to say, that's like Need for Speed. A old battered old speed. Daewoo. <laughs> One of them's got, it's a Suzuki uh, Solerio with the Nike tick on the front, plus sick rims, plus stickers all over the bonnet. It's a totally different car culture. And I'll, I'll give you the photos to put up here. I just think they're fantastic. Yes, I, I would love to do a deep dive into like some of those South American car cultures. I think they'd be absolutely yeah, fascinating. Yeah, that'd be, be great. Maybe we should go over. Oh, yeah, all right. I think we've, if anyone wants to sponsor us, uh, <laughs> email us, podcast at carexpert.com.au, and we'll take your sponsorship money for that. Uh, my pick is in a similar vein to yours. Yeah. It's an Instagram account that popped up called Basic Car Spotting. And if it's you've ever seen Exotic Car Spotting Australia or Melbourne Car Spotters, they're they always do supercars. These are uh, a little bit less than supercars. Uh, one is a Holden Captiva. <laughs> one's a Toyota Corolla. There is a, a VY Commodore. It's, but it's, there's always a secret in them. Yes. If you, and I don't want to spoil it because no. head to Instagram and check it out. Um, basic car spotters. And, and just keep an eye out. There's little Easter eggs, but it is absolute gold. I, I swear that whoever came up with that works in Petuta Advocate or something. That's, that's very good. Cool. <laughs> it's very good. Very good play on the Melbourne car spotters or exotic car spotting. Uh, that pretty much brings us to the end this week, guys. Josh, it has been a pleasure having you here, mate. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me on. You Hopefully did, not first and last. Yeah, well, you've done a good job, so we'll, we'll, see how, <laughs> we'll see what the viewers think of you. Any final thoughts from you guys before we wrap up? Nothing from me. Um, Whoa. Actually, okay. Okay, I do have something. Okay. Sorry. Your reaction sparked me. <laughs> Um, this goes out to Lance Stroll. Oh, yes, go uh, on. If there's a car in front of you and it breaks and you run into the back of it, it's your fault. Yeah. It's not the car in front's fault. Yes, I, I agree. Don't don't go immediately blaming everyone else for brake checking you. So yes. That was, that was shameful. Heart goes out to Danny Rick and for poor Oscar Piastri as well because they both suffered because of that one. Yeah, that two was, for the price of one on the Australian carnage front. Yeah, that was pretty average from uh, one L Stroll. Uh, <laughs> Josh, any final thoughts before you leave us? Well, I was going to say on that, Dan Ricardo is a very reasonable man and the way that he kind of reacted and got worked up over that, you know, it shows what the situation was. Yeah. I think it was a reasonable response, yeah. to be honest. <laughs> More measured than I would have been. Yes, we won't play that on this podcast because we'll uh, get a, an explicit rating. We don't want that. <laughs> but um, no, I think it was very fair. So uh, not of Lance, but of, of poor Danny Rick. So anyway, um, fingers crossed Miami is a better race for him because uh, for once he was actually in front of his teammate. He was on for a good result. So anyway, that brings us to the end this week. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Scott, thanks for coming. Josh, thanks for uh, putting yourself out this week. Thank Very you. much appreciated. We will be back next week with more exciting podcast news. We'll see you then.